All right, thank you. I, I am using this map because, well, you've had lots of maps today, and I thought you need a map from, uh, from the Asia Pacific. Uh, I'm, uh, yes, I am uh, currently in Hungary at the, at the European end of the Belt and Road, but I'm actually from the Pacific end of the Belt and Road, so I, so I want to actually talk about the, the, entire, the entire length of it. And I think to, to start and to talk about the Belt and Road Initiative before we get into political risks for business and for governments, we do need to have an understanding of the transformation of world order that we are moving through at the moment, or disruption, depending on your uh, perspective. And I think this map helps enormously because most of us in this room are used to American or European maps, right? And American and European maps massively exaggerate the size of North America and, and this, uh, this little peninsula off the edge of Eurasia called Europe uh, are massively exaggerated, usually in the maps that we've seen, because uh, Europe, as we heard earlier this morning, and, and, and uh, North America in uh, this last hundred years or so, have been the centres of power. And so naturally constructed in our minds, these places are very big and very central and very important. So as a humble citizen of, uh, of this country down here, and I grew up right down here at the very bottom of the map, uh, I want to give you a different perspective, and that is that a true scale map of the world shows you that one third of the planet is the Pacific Ocean. And, uh, and of course, as we know, the country that has uh, one in five people on Earth is right here and quite central in this map, not to mention that this one beside it has, has almost the same number as well. So in fact, this is really the demographic centre of the world. Uh, this is the environmental centre of the world because our climate change is being driven by what's happening in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, as, a as a result of all that coal that comes from here and goes up there to be burnt and then goes into the atmosphere. Uh, and, uh, and what is, of course, changing dramatically as we speak, and we all know this, but I think it's, it's necessary to, to say it at the very beginning, is that the economic power that was here and then was here, the, cent the centre of the world economy is now, is now here, or it's moving to there. So, so in the last decade or so, we've seen the situation where uh, the, the financial collapse of the United States and Europe, which was called a global financial crisis, because it was the United States and Europe, which actually wasn't a financial crisis in the rest of the world. But that, that created the conditions uh, that changed, started to change the mindsets of people in the East Asian region, because we'd had we'd had more than half a century of, of the East Asian economies growing. Before the Chinese experience, we'd had Japan and we'd had Korea and we'd had Singapore, Hong, Hong Kong, Taiwan, etc. So we'd had this, this, uh, this massive growth from a different development model than the European or American development model. Uh, and you'd, you'd had a, a model that did not fit the terms of the Washington Consensus, and in particular we saw that after the uh, Asian financial crisis, uh, where the, the economies of East Asia uh, balanced their, their books. They actually learnt the lessons of financial crisis, and they, they became uh, balanced economies, and, totally, and of course they were already totally integrated into the global economy. Uh, whereas after the current financial crisis, of course, Europe and the US have not, uh, have not uh, managed to, to address their massive imbalances. And so, so the reason I mention this is that in East Asia, a confidence continued to grow despite the financial crisis of 1997. The Asian development model was a great success. It was dramatically improving people's lives. And of course, we're all here talking about China. And as we know, the last 40 years, China replicated on a much bigger scale, uh, essentially the same phenomenon that had occurred in those other countries. And so you have, by the time of the global financial crisis, as it's called, you have this massive collapse of confidence in the West. You, you have for, for political and for economic and for social and cultural reasons, and not least because of the massive monopoly in, in the modern uh, digital economy of companies like Facebook, uh, you had this massive uh, change in the way that we thought about ourselves and this massive depression really in, in the West's mind. But in East Asia, that didn't happen. 
in East Asia, there's this enormous confidence. And so by, by the time of 20, 20, 2008, even 2008, when the export markets for China collapsed in North America and Europe, uh, and there, was, there were zero net exports from China in 2008, but still China grew. Still it continued to grow. And China had, uh, was in a position where actually it represented 50% of global growth. Uh, and of course, then you had the uh, you had the the phenomenon as we've talked about today as well of the of the change of leadership from 2012, and and coinciding with the change of leadership to a to a leader with a whether it's about him as an individual, whether it's about the party state as a whole, with this new confidence and this new approach, uh, you had coinciding with that as well the fact that all of the numbers started to fall. So, you know, you have China becomes the biggest exporter in the world. It becomes the biggest market for every industry sector you can name. By 2014, it's the biggest economy in the world on purchasing power parity. So during that time from the global financial crisis to about 2014, China just, just becomes number one. And, and even though we know in, in the usual GDP terms it's not yet, but in terms of the minds of people in East Asia, in this vertical here, uh, and you, even, even down in Australia, you, when you do run opinion polls and ask people which is the biggest economy, most Australians say China. So, so the mentality of the world has shifted. It's shifted enormously. And so after 40 years of China growing in, uh, in, a, in a sense in a passive way of being incorporated into the global system, and we, and we all brought China into the WTO, into APEC in the Asia Pacific, and China, China uh, became a, uh, a stakeholder in the current system and deeply integrated into that system, as we've heard today, deeply integrated into global supply chains in, in a way that on a much bigger scale than any of the other East Asian economies had done in, at this stage of development. Uh, however, the difference is uh, China suddenly becomes number one and there's this shift in the global balance in the sense that China has the opportunity to start becoming a leader to start playing a leading role. Now, many had, in, had encouraged China for the last 20 years or so. We've all seen this coming. We've all known this day, this period in time, this, this uh, transition would happen. And so there've been many leaders around the world encouraging China to, to think about how, what kind of leader is it going to be. And there was a lot of frustration up until 2012 that China had not really expressed uh, its, its views about how it would lead. But along comes Xi Jinping and along comes the Belt and Road Initiative. And so we now have a roadmap. We now have a picture which we can p look at from any number of different perspectives. But it is a, it is a roadmap. You've got to hand it, hand it to the Chinese leadership that they have articulated for us now uh, how they see their role in, uh, in global governance. Uh, they have established a new multilateral development bank, uh, the Asian Infrastructure investment bank. I mean, we, we in the Asia Pacific uh, have a, an infrastructure deficit of about one and a half trillion US dollars uh, to, if we, are, if we are to meet the sustainable development goals by 2030, I'm wearing my little sustainable development goals badge here. Uh, that's a huge gap that it was not being met by the Bretton Woods institutions. In fact, most of the countries that need this infrastructure could not get money from the, from the Bretton Woods institutions. So China steps in and says, well, we are now at this point in history where we have the capital, where we have the construction capabilities, uh, where we want to become your, your lender of choice. We'll, we'll come and we'll help you build that infrastructure that you want. So we're in this whole new ball game. We're all of, I mean, even though, even though actually in global terms, China's lending only accounts for 6% of global lending so far, but we all know the rate at which it's growing is dramatic. And, uh, and in particular, uh, China's lending to developing countries is growing very rapidly because of the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, and so however we construct the Belt and Road, and I could talk for a long time about how we do construct it, but I think I'll jump straight now because of limited time to this question of, well, what are the political risks? I mean, for, for businesses who have been uh, active in these global supply chains. For that first period of, of China's globalization, China was a player in the existing uh, system. 
and so you became a uh, you became a part of a supply chain with a Chinese company, and uh, you were dealing with fairly conventional political risks, which you could look at in terms of what country were you operating in, what were the issues on the ground, what were the economic management issues, what are the corruption issues, what are the, the rule of law issues, all of the standard country risks that, that, a, country, that a company takes into account uh, when it goes into a third country. And so if you were engaged with a, with a Chinese business partner uh, in the last 40 years, you essentially took a fairly traditional political risk approach and you might, in addition to looking at the country risks, uh, you might in addition look at the project risks or the, the firm level risks around a project and that's where you would look specifically at all kinds of more uh, micro level risks. But the Belt and Road Initiative introduces for us another level, another level of risks which are geopolitical. Because no matter how you construct the uh, Belt and Road Initiative, whether you see it as, as a grand plan for Chinese maritime uh, dominance of the world or whether you just see as it as China wanting to support the developing countries of the world to, to build their infrastructure and to build trade and investment corridors, regardless of how you construct it, it shifts the geopolitics. And so, so we now find that if you're, a, if you're a company that was dealing, if you were go back five years and you were a company that was dealing with Huawei, for example, uh, you, you might have constructed your risks very differently from the way you might have to do today because you're in a position where you've got uh, countries such as Australia uh, being the first country that made a determination that, uh, that it uh, did not believe that it had the capability uh, to defend itself if a theoretical scenario occurred where one company controlled its 5G network uh, and where that company theoretically, uh, if it had the ability uh, to, to utilise its monopoly for espionage or even worse, for, for implanting malicious coding or, or software. Uh, this was a theoretical scenario uh, and actually it's an interesting one because it does raise questions. There's deep integration, there's deep globalisation that we have. It's a very interesting question about the risks that occur to us. I mentioned before the risks from Facebook that I think <laughs> have generated political chaos and disaster across much of the world. Maybe there are risks from Huawei too and so, so this raises real questions for us. We've heard about ports, port infrastructure. If you engaged in a project to build a port, traditionally you would look at a whole range of political risks but you wouldn't have to deal with the political risk of, of your project being entirely uh, represented in the media and in, and in the, from Congress to parliaments around the world in an entirely fictional manner, uh, such as has, has happened with the Hambantota port in Sri Lanka, uh, the port in uh, Vanuatu that I was involved with uh, the last few years uh, uh, as, as Trade Commissioner for the Pacific Island countries and China. I observed a complete construction of a fiction around a Chinese project that was, uh, that was investing uh, to support uh, a developing country to build a piece of infrastructure that was a very valuable piece of infrastructure for its economic development within its debt ceiling, uh, with a very uh, clear contract that said that this, will, this is a PPP that will revert to the government, cannot be used as a military base, uh, it, and, and it has a certain you know, 20 year uh, term for its concessional loan that China lends uh, now you could argue that uh, the concession alone could have been better negotiated by the country at the other end, but this is a conventional port project. But the media uh, and think tanks all across the world and many conferences I've been to where I, you hear this about Sri Lanka, but you hear it about Vanuatu now. Oh, Chinese are, uh, have seized this, this uh, port and they're building a military base there. So there's this, there's this now, this fictional uh, approach, which is, comes entirely from the geopolitics, the fact that we've got a, uh, you know, a, a US administration that has now identified that China is a strategic competitor and uh, therefore as we hear from Mike Pence, it's trapping countries in debt and it's, uh, uh, and it's engaged in uh, you know, all, all of these nefarious activities, some of which may be true by the way, uh, but arguably is true of all great powers. Uh, but the, the terms of the debate have become so ideologised and so exaggerated that it's very difficult to have a factual, uh, practical discussion as at a firm level, and this is why the political risk approach is an interesting one, because if you're a firm, you need to actually understand what are the objective risks here. But the danger uh, of the Belt and Road is that it introduces 
this geopolitical level, in addition to the country risks and in addition to the project risks. Um, it also, there are potentially other risks as well in that uh, China is a country that is in still the very early stages of its internationalization. So these Chinese firms that are going out into uh, you know, 150 countries around the world are very skilled and experienced in infrastructure projects, but they don't necessarily always have the cultural skills or the soft skills to implement these projects successfully in terms of how they build a relationship with governments and stakeholders and employees. And this is not a Chinese problem alone. This is a classic problem of a country that's in the early stages of its internationalization. And you could have said exactly the same of Japan in its early days. You could say the same of my own country, Australia, when it went out to the uh, Pacific Islands and Papua New Guinea and invested in big mining projects. They were a disaster initially. So every country makes these mistakes. China's making lots of mistakes. But the frame that we're suddenly putting around the Belt and Road Initiative includes a whole lot of hyperbole and it includes a whole lot of uh, exaggeration, which is a huge political risk for businesses and not, not to mention for governments as well, because 125 governments around the world have signed MOUs to, to participate in Belt and Road projects. And uh, you know, we heard in the first presentation there are still a few countries that haven't, but even those countries that haven't, you know, Japan is actively partnering with, uh, uh, with China on uh, rail projects in Thailand. Uh, uh, India's obviously got its particular geopolitical uh, uh, issues with China, and so there's not so much collaboration happening there. But you know, Australia, very good example of a country that hasn't joined the Belt and Road, but why would it need to? It's already the fifth biggest trading partner for China. It's already supplying China with its natural gas and its iron ore and its coal and its uh, uh, and, and a whole range of other uh, commodities and, and is already, has been for since 1979 until just a couple of years ago, the number one destination for Chinese investment. So there's plenty of Chinese infrastructure in Australia. So why would Australia need to join the Belt and Road Initiative unless it was to partner with China in third countries, which may well be a, a clever idea, but it's not one that's yet politically possible. So that's a very brief overview of a much longer paper that if people are interested in these issues I'm very happy to, to share my much longer paper with, uh, with people but I look forward to your questions. Thank you.